Out of the reasons uh, that we may have for giving thanks uh, to God this Thanksgiving season, the chief of which ought to be giving thanks to God as the video shows because of His Son, Jesus Christ. The act of giving thanks, moreover, acknowledges God as a sovereign, sufficient source, supplier, and sustainer of all that we have in Jesus Christ. In this way, the conclusion to our passage this morning calls our attention to the glory of God as the goal of thanksgiving to God because thanksgiving magnifies the surpassing glory of God as the sufficient source, supplier, and sustainer of all our needs. So the goal of thanksgiving, as the title this morning, is the glory of God. I sometimes browse Reddit, and one of the Reddit uh, subreddits that I follow is Black people Twitter. It's, I do it for comedy. It's fun. Um, and I saw one of the memes. It was a picture of, of a black mom, just a table full of food, and it was just her sitting. And the caption read on the meme, Mom asked everyone to leave and have a solo picture because no one helped her cook all the food. So she wants the glory to herself. It's the exact same idea. We give thanks when we, oh, we give thanks to God because we acknowledge God is the one who has done everything. No one else. He's the one who supplies your every need. He's the one who has sustained us. He's the one who guides us. He's the one who uh, fills our every need. So God alone is to be glorified. So by way of review, let us recall the two main ideas of thanksgiving we have covered thus far in our passage. First, we discover the reason for thanksgiving. Namely, Paul gave thanks to God for increasing faith and growing love in the midst of affliction. As we see in verse 3, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, because it is right. Because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. So two reasons for faith, I mean for thanksgiving. Faith is growing, love increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God because or for your steadfastness and faith. So there it is again. Faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. So just to review, Paul here is likely alluding to Acts chapter 17, where he visited the city of Thessalonica, and he went to the city of, of 
uh, to the synagogue there, and he persuaded many of the Jews and Greeks to believe that Jesus is the Messiah because he has died and he is resurrected. And uh, some of the Jews, however, rejected this gospel, this truth about Jesus, and their rejection turned into rage, so much so that they incited the whole city of Thessalonica to riot against Paul and those who believe in Jesus, especially this guy named Jason. So Jason is famous in the Bible because he was from the city of Thessalonica, and his body was dragged through the streets, all because he believed in Jesus Christ. And this is the uh, situation or the historical background that Paul may be giving thanks to God for, that in, in spite of or in the midst of their persecution for believing in Jesus, yet the Thessalonian church persisted in their faith, and not just persisted, but in fact grew more in their faith and their love for one another. Significantly, as we have learned, growing faith and increasing love in affliction testifies to the righteous judgment of God, which is the second main idea of the passage. We covered this last week. We're just reviewing so that we understand the context of what's going on. The explanation for the reason is that our growing faith and increasing love testifies or is evidence of God's righteous judgment. Follow along again silently in verse 3. We had always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as it's right, because your faith is, in, is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and the afflictions that you are enduring. And this, what is this? Their faith and their love growing and increasing. That is evidence of the righteous judgment of God. That's the explanation for increasing faith and growing love. It demonstrates, it testifies to the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Now, how in the world does faith and love demonstrate God's righteous judgment? If you remember last week, first we have a negative answer. That is to say, those who do not have faith and love are those whom God's righteous judgment is poured out against in His wrath because they rejected the good news of Jesus Christ. In verse 6, Since indeed God considers it righteous to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to those who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance who do not know God. This is God's righteous judgment. And on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. So what does it mean then that increasing faith and growing love testifies to the righteous judgment of God? It means that those who do not have, negatively first, faith and love, they will suffer God's righteous judgment in His wrath. Because they rejected the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The good news that God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago to live the perfect life of obedience that no one could live. Adam failed in the Garden of Eden. Israel failed in the wilderness. Both were exiled from God's presence. And we fail every day. The greatest commandment is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is to say, we're supposed to express satisfaction in God's provisions for us. Whatever God has given us, it is good, it is perfect, it is right. But we covet. But we grumble. But we complain. Now, say, Paul states that do not covet because that is idolatry. And that is the greatest sin in the Bible to express dissatisfaction and ingratitude towards God. And as Romans state, this is why the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. So the negative explanation then as to why faith, hope, and love demonstrate God's righteous judgment is that those who do not have faith and love are those who suffer God's righteous judgment in wrath. 
Positively, however, believers who trust in the gospel, who put their hope and faith in Jesus, they will escape God's righteous judgment against them. And the proof, the badge, the evidence that we have that we will in fact escape God's righteous judgment in the future because we have trusted in Jesus Christ's death in the past, that His death took on God's wrath against us. And by His death on the cross, He removed God's anger against us because of our sin on the basis of our faith. The proof that that transaction has in fact transpired is our daily and our present increasing faith in Jesus and growing love towards one another. So that is the positive explanation in verse 10. When He comes on that day to be glorified in His saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed. Why? Because our testimony to you was believed. Now, this is uh, quite difficult in the English translations for us to pick up. But in the original language, believe is uh, pisteo and faith is pistis. So it's the exact same root word. But in English, it doesn't quite pick it up. Where faith is the noun, believe is the verb. I, I hope we can uh, come up with a verb faith, like faithing, but it's like believing. So there's, it doesn't work in the, in, in the English translation. But in the original language, those who believe are those who have faith. Faith. So this is why increasing faith and growing love as proof of that faith demonstrates God's righteous judgment precisely because when we believe in Jesus, we believe that His death on the cross removed God's wrath against us in the day of judgment. So our judgment has already passed because of our faith in Jesus, that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That Jesus is the one whom God made, who knew no sin, to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. That Jesus is the servant from Isaiah 53, who was crushed for our iniquities, who was bruised for our transgression. By His stripes we are healed. That Jesus is He whom in the Old Testament... You have to cry out, unclean, unclean, if you have leprosy. Jesus became unclean for us. And the Father yelled at Him, unclean, unclean at the cross. Because He bore our sins. And God's wrath was meted against Him. So that the Father can in turn turn towards Pastor Joel, you, and declare to you, clean, clean, clean. This is what the gospel does. It removes God's wrath against us. And the proof that this, in fact, happened in the past and will not happen for us in the future is that presently we are growing in our faith and we are increasing in our love. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14, it states for us the object of our faith. For if we believe, what is our faith? That Jesus died, that he rose from the dead. Even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. The result and the implication for giving thanks to God is nothing less than the glory of God. The implication of God's righteous judgment in His wrath to bring about judgment against unbelievers and in His mercy to save those who trust in His Son is that all these things are for the glory of God. In verse 10, when He comes on that day to be glorified in His saints, and to be marveled, which is uh, 
um, conceptually similar to be glorified at among all who have believed because our testimony to you is believed so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The word glory is an ambiguous term, sort of like blessing. You ask someone to define it, they can't really define it. It's just so used, but very difficult to pin down as to what glory means or blessing means. Bless, uh, glory just means weight. That's all the word means. Heavy. Chavod. In Hebrew, doxa. In Greek, it just means heavy. That's all. Now, how does that apply to God being glorified, God being made heavy? Well, in the book of uh, Genesis, we see that Abraham received glory because he had more cattle and golds and silvers and servants than anyone else. And the idea was that he had so much of it that literally it became heavy. It's so plentiful that it becomes weighty. And once you have more of it than anyone else in the world, then you receive honor. And people will marvel. Wow, look at this guy. He has the most cattle. He has the most gold. He has the most silver in all the world. So they marvel. And they give him honor. Just, that's what happened to Abraham. I was reading a documentary of uh, this uh, three young girls who have probably the biggest shoe collection in the world. They have all the Jordans. They have a gym full of just shoe collections. And those who are into uh, sneakers, the sneaker heads, they give these girls props. They give this girl glory. Why? Because they have the most shoes. They have the most abundance of collections of Jordans and all kinds of rare vintage shoes. They have so much of it that it becomes heavy. They have to store it in a big basketball gymnasium filled to the walls. They have so much of it that they have glory and honor among those who treasure shoes. Now when it comes to God, what does God have more than anyone else? What makes God heavy? Why is God weighty? God, listen carefully, has more character than anyone else. He has more power, more wisdom, more might, more strength, more mercy, more wrath, more righteousness, more love, more kindness, more steadfastness, more tender mercies, than anyone else in the universe. He has so much of these qualities that it becomes heavy. And because it is heavy out of the abundance and surplus of His character that we marvel, that we give Him glory or weight. Our passage in particular highlights the chief quality of God, the chief character of God. If there was one thing about God that is greater than all of His other qualities combined, the chief, the capstone to the glory of God is not His love. It is not His mercy. Well, it could be mercy. It's close. It's not his wrath. It is not his power. 
the capstone to the glory of God is His grace. It is the grace of God. That's why he says in our passage, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you. That the reputation of the name of Jesus may be made heavy in you. What is it about the weight of Jesus, about his reputation that needs to be heavy in, in us? It is according to the grace of our God. What does grace mean? I think the Spanish language picks it up quite perfectly. Gratis, from the Latin gratia, from the Greek caris. What does gratis mean in Spanish? Free. What does grace mean in the Bible? Freedom. God is free. He does whatever He pleases. He's not bound to anyone. He's not bound to love me. He's not bound to love you. He's not bound to save me. He's not bound to do anything. Everything God does is in accordance to His good pleasure. Nothing else. Nothing else. That's why everything God does is according to His grace. Because we do not constrain God in any way. He does so out of his free will. Nothing else. And how do we know this? Well, I've seen, as we have seen in our passage, God inflicts punishment against unbelievers in his righteousness because it is according to his will. He does this. Verse 5, this is evidence of God's righteous judgment. And negatively, what does that mean? We read this already, that God considers it just to what? Repay with affliction. Who brings about God's affliction? God does. Who will judge the living and the dead on the day of judgment? God will. And God does this out of His good pleasure. God is He who will judge everyone. This is why we are not free moral agents to do whatever we please. This is why we cannot do whatever we like. This is why morality is not according to our whim and our convenience. Morality is absolute. And the reason for this is we must give an account before God for what we have done in our body, Paul says, whether it is good or whether it is evil, we must give an account. In the original language, it's stronger. It is necessary. It is necessary. You, me, everyone must give an account. And God does this because he is free to do it. God's freedom is displayed not only in His wrath, but also in His mercy to save us from His wrath by making us worthy of His kingdom. We don't make ourselves worthy of His kingdom. God does. In verse 5, that you may be considered worthy of His kingdom. It's in the passive voice. Someone else is making us worthy. God is. Verse 11, to this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy. Who makes us worthy of God's kingdom? Our sacraments? Our church attendance? Our prayers? Our Hail Marys? Who makes us worthy? Certainly not me. Most assuredly not you. God makes us worthy. He does everything. And when he does everything, it's called grace. That's why it's free, because he does the whole thing. 
God also shows His exceeding grace in fulfilling His resolve in us in holiness and in our obedience to His Word. Verse 11, And our God may make you worthy of His calling and may fulfill every resolve. Who fulfills our resolve to fight against sin? Who does that? Who gives us the willpower to pray in the morning when we are tired, when we would rather look at Facebook? Who gives us the resolve to read Scripture when we would rather check our emails? Who does that? Our God. He fulfills every resolve for good and every work of faith. How? By our willpower? By our strength? By our free will? By our goodness? No, it is by the power of God. And since God is the one who's doing everything, He's the one who judges the wicked, He's the one who saves the saints. He's the one who makes us worthy. He's the one who fulfills every resolve in us to obey and trust in Him since He's doing all these things. Therefore, verse 12, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be what? Heavy. Glorified in you. Why? Because God is the one who's doing everything. What is it called when God is the one doing everything? Grace, free, gratis. He gets all the glory. No one else. Jesus alone is a sufficient source, supplier, and sustainer of our every need. So the goal of thanksgiving begins in verse 3. I give thanks to God. And it ends in verse 12 so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you. The goal of verse 3 is in verse 12. That Jesus may be glorified. How? Because everything our faith, our love, our suffering in the midst of enduring the judgment of unbelievers who will afflict us, our resolve to do every good work. Everything is because of the grace of God. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Paul ends his first letter to the church in Thessalonica. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who's, who's doing all these things? God. Why will God do these things? Because is he, is he obligated to me? No, because he is faithful who calls you. And He will bring it to pass. He alone. What is the explanation that God is faithful to us? What is the explanation that God will bring it to pass? In verse 25, or 28 rather, because God is free. It's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the... Um, Benefits of uh, being a stay-at-home pastor, we don't have an office, so I do all my work at home, is that I get to spend a lot of time with our kids. And you better believe that spending time with our kids, I'm going to, you know, whip the rod and make sure that they do their work. They, on average, do about two to three hours of homework every day. Uh, they, they finish their week's homework on the first day, like in an hour, they finish everything, and the rest of the week they're doing extra work that I give them. I'm a taskmaster. 
at the home. But I do it in love, obviously. Uh, so about, you know, and this is quite difficult, to be honest, because it's hard to keep kids motivated and concentrated and focused. Those who are teachers know this. Their attention span is very short. So you have to keep them motivated and you have to keep them on task with, a, with, you know, with their studies at hand. So it's a lot of work for me. And uh, I get stressed out you know, because of it too. And uh, about a month and a half ago, we finally had our first uh, parent-teacher conference and uh, you know the teachers were like showing all the the test scores of Owen and Naomi. You know they they already passed the year end on the first test. They're doing all they're doing well and all these things. And because they know that my wife is a teacher, they thank her. It's like oh, I want to thank you <laughs> for working with your kids. I don't need to teach them anymore. They already passed the year end benchmarks on the first test. What else do we teach them? So they, they think, oh, you're doing such a good job. And my wife knows what's up. <laughs> she knows the real deal. She would gently correct them. She says, actually, it's my husband. I don't really do anything. He's the one who does everything. So if you want to thank someone, you should thank my husband. Because he does everything. Paul says, I give thanks to God for your increasing faith and growing love in the midst of affliction. And this is the righteous judgment of God, negatively to bring affliction to those who afflict us and to save us on the day of judgment from the wrath of God. And God will make us worthy of this calling. And to this end, we always pray, Paul says, that God will sustain us till the very end. So that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in us. The goal of giving thanks is to acknowledge that God is the one who has done everything. I mean everything. Because he does it all, it's called grace. He is free and it's free for us. And since it is grace, it is His glory and not ours. We are saved by grace so that no one can boast. The purpose of grace is to remove the ground for boasting that we cannot do anything by ourselves, but only by the grace of of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let us join Paul this morning in giving thanks for our increasing faith and growing love because we see that it is He who is doing, willing, making us worthy of His kingdom until the end.